again, we're just going to wait another minute until we have most people on. Uh, we still have people coming into oh. the waiting room. Um, so that would be great if you could just make sure you have your mutes, your mutes, your mics muted and your video off. That would make everything run a lot smoother. Thank you. Right. So we are going to get started. We want to be um, respectful of everyone's time. I have 1101. People are still coming and that's perfectly fine. So uh, welcome to our continuing series of birding webinars. My name is Stacy and I will be your presenter today for Vultures 101. Uh, these are incredibly interesting birds and hold a very special job in our ecosystems. So this should be a lot of fun. If you have any questions uh, that come up during the webinar, feel free to use the chat window and we will make sure to get to everyone by the end. And we'll be taking a look at that a little more in the next slides. But as you come on, please make sure that your video is off and your audio is muted. Uh, and we are also streaming this live on Facebook too. All right, so I'll get right into it. Zoom is our platform for all of these webinars. Most of us are experts at this point, but if not, we just want to be respectful of that and give you a quick overview. Just want to point out once again, you see it circled in a green circle that your video and mic should have that red line through it. It just makes our technology run a lot smoother. Um, one of the things that we use a lot in this, and I can see that we've already started in our chat box, uh, you should see it says everyone. Feel free to use that to ask any questions. We do have Tyler Cash is in our chat box here on Zoom. We'll be happy to answer any of those. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, Sarah Doxon uh, will be joining us on that end to help answer any questions. When I'm in full screen, your screen should be in full screen as well. If you need to exit it, just hit escape or click exit full screen. So, uh, just want to introduce you to us. So my name is Stacy Monahan. I am the Camp and Family Programs Coordinator. And like I said earlier, joining us in the chat window is Tyler Cash. He is one of our amazing environmental educators. And today my favorite vulture is the top picture. It is our classic turkey vulture. Uh, you'll learn a bit more as to why I love them so much. I had an opportunity to, to work with one many years ago. And the bottom picture is a California condor and Tyler is a native of California. So that is his favorite vulture for the day. A little bit about our organization. So we are the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. We are a nonprofit. Our headquarters is based in Brighton, Colorado. It's on the Bar Lake State Park property. And we also have an office up in Fort Collins, Colorado. So our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats through an integrated approach of our science, stewardship, and education teams. And I think that makes us really special because we have all three of these teams working closely together. Our science teams are the people who are out doing the research. Our research ranges up through Canada, across the Rockies, down into Mexico. They're publishing papers. They're figuring out what is going on with our birds. Then our stewardship team is the go-between. So once we know what's happening with the birds and how we need to help them, they're the ones connecting to the landowners and the ranchers and making sure that not only that land is good for the cattle, but also for the birds and their habitat, which in turn makes it a healthier habitat for us as humans. And finally, our amazing education team. We like to think we are inspiring our next generation. We get to do all the great things like these webinars. Pre-COVID, we were going into schools um, to do presentations. We had field trips, family events, 
homeschool programs, a variety of camp programs. So we love getting out there and connecting with everyone. And all of this is so that we can ensure a healthy and happy habitat, not only for birds, but for us as humans as well for uh, centuries to come. Okay, so now that you've gotten to know a little bit about us, we would love to get to know you. So in the chat box, if you could please type in where you are watching from, how many people are watching with you today, and what's your favorite bird? We would love to know those things. So I'll give you all about a, a minute or so to do that. Uh, this information just helps us to know who we're interacting with, and a lot of our funding actually re relies on participation numbers. All right, we have North Carolina, Greeley, Colorado, St. Paul, Minnesota. I love, love the turkey vultures. Utah, North Carolina again. Oh, tufted titmouse, I love them too. One of the really cool things about our webinars is that we can see we reach a much broader population than just, than just right in Colorado. So that's really cool. And even all throughout Colorado. Grand Junction, Evergreen, lots of Colorado. Beautiful, Georgia, that's awesome. So keep them coming in. We love to see everyone's favorite birds. Um, I know it's a big thing to ask for, especially for people who really like birds. So maybe just your favorite bird of the day, that's totally fine. Uh, New Jersey, cool. So keep that coming in. Uh, we are excited to have everyone here with us today. So in this webinar, we are going to be learning about the various adaptations of our vultures. We will be able to identify a handful of the new world vultures, and we'll learn more about that in a minute. And we're going to learn why vultures are an important part of our ecosystems. So why birds? Um, why are we talking about vultures today? Well, one of the things is that we believe birds are inspirational. Uh, from artwork to engineering, birds have been inspiring people for ages. Uh, and they're really accessible no matter where you are, whether you're in the heart of Denver or New York City or out in the farmlands, you'll be able to see birds. Now, the variety and species might look very different, um, but you'll still see a bird nonetheless. They provide ecosystem services. This is especially where our turkey vultures come in. Um, they can be pest controls or seed dispersals. And finally, they are environmental indicators. They are our true canary in the coal mine. Um, birds are one of the first groups to really be affected by environmental changes, which is one of the reasons our scientists are out there doing this research to see what is going on. All right, so just to give you a general idea of how many birds we are working with in the world, we have around 10,000 species. We start focusing that into North America, we have about 1,000 species. Zone in closer to Colorado, we have 507. And then finally, even more zoomed in where we are based out of at Bar Lake State Park, we have 350 species. I would definitely say if you are in the area, and it is safe for you to do so and you're able, head out to Bar Lake State Park at some point. They have beautiful nature trails. We have a lot of cool shorebirds coming in right now and a fabulous nature center for your littles or, or young ones. Okay, now we're going to jump right in. Vultures, uh, they're divided up into new world vultures versus old world vultures. Uh, what's the difference? So our new world vultures are found in the Americas, so North and South America, and in the Caribbean, whereas our old world vultures are native to Europe, Africa, and Asia. 
So what's cool is that means between the two groups, vultures are found on every continent except Australia and Antarctica. Uh, we have 16 species of old world vultures and they belong to the family Accipiteridae, which includes our eagles and kites and our hawks. And old world vultures find the carcasses or carrion exclusively by sight, which is very different than our new world. Um, and we will be focusing on our new world vultures and condors um, today in this webinar. They tend to be found in warm and temperate areas of the Americas. And if you have heard about vultures being clumped in with raptors and that whole debate it's it's very interesting within the scientific community and with ornithologists so our new world vultures were thought not to be closely related to the Accipteridae, but they actually belong in the family Cathartidae, which was once considered to be related to storks However, recent DNA evidence suggests that they should be included among the Accipteridae, along with other birds of prey. However, they're still not closely related to, to other vultures. Um, a lot of our vultures have a great sense of smell, which is unusual for raptors. So that's why you'll see, depending on if you have a newer version of a bird field guide versus an older, you might see them put in different families and it has gone back and forth. So it's very interesting. Um, we have seven species in the New World vultures. They are our black vulture, our turkey vulture, our lesser yellow-headed vulture, greater yellow-headed vulture, California condor, Andean condor, and the king vulture. So those are the ones we're gonna kind of hone in on today. And if you're wondering what these vultures are up in this picture, they are white rumped vultures that are found in India. So let's get right to it and start thinking, uh, what are some amazing adaptations of our vultures? You can see I put a few different pictures of a couple of different species up here. So what are some adaptations or characteristics that you think of? Um, and an adaptation is something that an animal or a plant has either physical that they have on them or a behavior that helps them to survive. So what are some of those things that you can think of that make our vultures different from our other birds out there. Yep, strong sense of smell, no feathers on their head. Yep, their beaks. Yeah, their bald head. Oh, I see some familiar names on here. Excited to have everyone. Big wingspans to soar. Yep, the ability to soar on thermals for long periods of time. Awesome. Great answers. Feel free to, to keep them coming in. Like I said, Tyler will be able to, to check in on it too. Yeah, some really strong gut microbes. <laughs> um, break down that stuff, that hooked beak. <laughs> Pee on their feet to clean them. Yeah, awesome job. So like I said, feel free to, to keep them coming in. And I'll just throw up here some the things that we have. And a lot of them that you said, uh, they have that bald or mostly featherless head, kind of a larger body, a bit more chicken-like feet, not quite the talons that if you think of comparing it to an eagle. Very social, good eyesight, great sense of smell, that hooked beak. They, they defecate or urine on their legs or their feet. Um, fantastic job, everyone. Yeah, throwing up for self-defense, uh, mostly eat carrion. Carrion is another word for carcasses, dead animals. Uh, beautiful. So what we're going to do now is we're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of these amazing adaptations that make our vultures so interesting and, and really cool birds in my book. Um, and does anyone have any guesses as to what 
these, I know we haven't gone into them yet, but what these three different vultures may be. Giving a, a little challenge. Yeah, black vulture on top for sure. Good job. So we have our black vulture is on the top. Our bottom left is a greater yellow headed vulture. And the bottom right is our California condor. So we'll be like said, learning more about those in a little bit. Fantastic, everyone. So they're kind of like nature's trash disposals. <laughs> they're their cleanup crew. So why do we need that? So a few different of their adaptations, their bald head, that hooked beak, and their really good smell and vision, they all help these vultures fit into their niche. Does anyone have any idea as to why they think that these specific adaptations would help them? I don't have any guesses as to why you think they would have that bald head or that hooked beak or that great sense of smell. Yeah. Head doesn't get covered with gross stuff. The sun might clean it, might blend into their surrounding to smell their food, see their food. They'll get blood on it. Awesome job, everyone. Uh, I love our brains are working this early in the morning. Yeah, so these vultures, I just think they're so cool. Uh, as they're soaring high above, not only do they use their sight, but they use their sense of smell to find their decaying food. Uh, it's been recorded that they can smell their carrion for over a mile away. And specifically our turkey vulture, which is what I do have pictured here, um, it's eating a, a sheep carcass on the bottom and a close up of its beautiful face up top, is that the turkey vulture has the largest olfactory system of all the birds. Now, an olfactory system is what helps it smell. So a scientist, Dr. Graves, um, had, was able to study them and published in scientific reports that on average, the turkey vulture has an olfactory bulb that is four times larger than that of the black vulture, which we're gonna learn a little bit about. And when compared with 143 other species, the bulb is significantly larger relative to the brain volume. So what takes up the most space and our, specifically our turkey vulture's head is that olfactory bulb, their sense of smell. Now, what's really cool is that they were able to study this. Um, they had a permit, they were with the Smithsonian Museum. Uh, because our vultures, like we said, they're now grouped in with um, raptors and they're protected under the Migratory Treaty Bird Act. So we can't hunt them. We can't go out and collect their feathers or eggs or anything like that. They're protected. So in order to be able to do this scientific study, they had to get live specimens, well, that then had to die, to be able to look into their brain. They actually found at an airport, I believe it was in Nashville, they were able to, um, they were okayed by the US Fish and Wildlife. They had to call this group of turkey vultures that I guess had been hanging out there for too much. So Dr. Graves and his group immediately jumped on it saying, we have a permit, can we get your vultures? So they did. So they were able to get their heads, dissect their brains and able to look in it and also noticed that there is something called emitrial cells, which all animals have, and this helps transmit information about smell to the brain. They kind of serve as a proxy for the sensitivity of the sense of smell. And what they were able to study, because they were able to look at these turkey vulture brains under a microscope, which had not been done before, is that turkey vultures had twice as many as mitrial cells as black vultures, despite having a brain that's a fifth smaller. Because remember their olfactory bulb was so big, didn't leave a whole lot of space for the brain. 
Um, so that microscopic look was important because there had been no published data on the number of mitral cells in even in avian olfactory bulbs had existed prior. So it was really cool that they were able to do this. And now at the Smithsonian, in nice little formaldehyde jars, we have turkey vulture brains um, and heads. So they're able to learn even more about these fantastic birds. Excuse me. So that's part of their smell. They can find it. And once they find their, their meal, they have that bald head. If you think of them, they're neck deep getting into all those crevices and organs. There might be rotting meat and blood, lots of bacteria. And like you all said, they don't have a whole lot of big feathers on their head is so that the meat and all those things don't stick to it as much. And when they're able to sun themselves outside, it bakes off, it kills that bacteria. The meat, if something did get stuck, falls off a lot faster rather than getting it stuck in their fur. Um, really cool adaptation. So if we did not have our turkey vultures, um, our vultures around, what do you think would be a consequence of that? So if we didn't have these turkey vultures around to kind of help clean up, what do you think might, might happen in the natural world out there? <laughs> Dead carcasses all around the world. <laughs> Yeah, there would definitely take a lot longer for things to decompose. Turkey vultures and a lot of vultures really help with that, that decomposition. Um, <laughs> lots of, yeah, lots of dead things everywhere. Uh, if you think more disease transmission, yes, yeah, great job, everyone. So A, we would have a lot more of roadkill, of animals that have died, whether it's in the forest or prairie. Um, it would take a lot longer for them to decompose. And also that increase in diseases and potentially increase in, in pest animals because if you take something out of the ecosystem, another animal will fill it. Um, and rotting meat, you know, is a great vector for, for diseases and such. So they're really cool birds, do a great job. Yeah, it can damage rivers and streams. Um, so these vultures really help us out. So like we said, they eat dead things. <laughs> um, they usually find the dead animal within 12 to, to 24 hours. Um, and it's really interesting, you'll see that a lot of vultures depend on one another, different species. So a lot of times our black vultures will look and follow turkey vultures to the food source because like we learned earlier, our turkey vultures have phenomenal smells. That olfactory bulb is much larger um, in their skull than it is in our black vultures. So they will follow the turkey vultures um, and they'll all be eating on the carcass, but if you notice, they'll kind of take one at a time. They, they kind of have a little hierarchy there. Um, another thing is that sometimes some of our vultures, because they actually have weak legs and feet, you'll notice in the top picture, that doesn't look like an eagle's talons or a uh, red-tailed hawk talons. They're not as strong, which is obviously a big characteristic if you're defined as a raptor. Um, but they do generally have, have good bills, but they sometimes will wait till another animal or predator will rip open that carcass to open that flesh up before they feed. So a lot of times vultures are seen with other carrion eating animals such as hyenas or coyotes or eagles. Um, because they're not quite strong enough to initially rip into it. And once we, I've seen mentioned, once they're able to eat the meat, they do have very strong stomach acid along with a whole crazy family of microbes in there that are able to digest things that would otherwise um, kill us as humans and, and other animals, which is really cool. Something else that someone had mentioned as a really cool adaptation is urohydrosis. That's a fancy name for it. Does anyone know what that fancy name is for? Urohydrosis, what does that mean? Yeah, 
peeing on the feet. It is a fancy scientific word we gave for, yeah, urinating or defecating on, on themselves. Um, once again, might seem gross. It's actually really, really cool. Uh, the turkey vultures urinate down their legs. It's called urohydrosis. And it actually helps to cool off the vultures during hot weather. Not only that, the uric acid that's in there can also help kill off any bacteria or parasites that they've picked up from walking on um, or through the carcasses or perching on the dead animals. So it's that kind of like whitewash you see in that, that, top, um, that top picture. Um, they, some scientists also believe that the, the bald head also helps with thermoregulation as well. Um, so cool things. I'm glad humans don't do that, but it's really cool that the vultures do. Another thing that I saw people mention prior as well when we were talking about adaptations is their ability to projectile vomit. Now, why in the world would it behoove a vulture to projectile vomit? Why do we think they are doing that? How would that help them? Maybe as part of safety. Yeah. So others don't steal their food, defense mechanism. Feeding their young. Awesome. Great job, everyone. I, I absolutely love, even if you're not sure, feel free to type in the chat box. We always tell our, our campers and our kiddos that it's okay to, to guess. That's how we learn. That means you're thinking about it. Um, yeah, I, I, someone says they wouldn't want to be vomited on, so it makes the animals back off. All these things are right. So they do it um, as a defense mechanism. It can deter those predators. Apparently, black vultures are really good at projectile vomiting. Um, I'm not sure if there's been any studies done. Maybe that's a fun challenge if you have spare time later to look up projectile vomiting and raptors. Um, but yeah, they do it to scare off predators. It smells horrible. I know this from experience, at least with the turkey vulture. Um, and they also do it because it will lighten up their body. If they just ate a whole bunch, they're heavier and weighted down. And if they projectile vomit at the potential predator, um, it will make them a lot lighter, so it's a lot faster for them to take off. And they also uh, do regurgitate their, their food to their, to their young. So great job, everyone. Such interesting birds. So another thing, um, a really cool adaptation that also sets our vultures apart is uh, their communication. So up in the top picture, it's just a picture of a songbird. And you'll notice they have a syrinx or a voice box. This is what allows them to make all their beautiful songs and calls that we hear. Now, if you think about vultures, if you've been able to see them or, or been around them, you don't usually think about them calling or singing or anything. And that's because our new world vultures actually lack that syrinx or that voice box and they're nearly silent. So their typical vocalizations are limited to, to grunts and hisses and bill clacks um, and other similar sounds that do not require those complex vocal cords. And because they're really social birds, um, one of the theories that scientists think is when they roost together, especially at night, uh, that they're using those grunts and clacks to actually communicate where the food might be. And that's really cool. That's something I, I had not known prior. To, to some of the research that I did. So it's really interesting that they're so social that they don't have these, you know, syrinxes, but they still find a way to communicate. They also use body language too, um, you know, like running off another vulture if it's nearing on its predatory, doing those hisses um, and those clacks. So they still found a way to, to communicate. It's just different than when we think of a, a typical bird. So I thought that was really fun. Nesting. 
So something else that vultures do, and it does very much vary depending upon the species, are California condors will nest on um, cliff ledges, uh, turkey vulture nest. It's actually, they're really hard to find in turkey vultures and black vultures and a handful of other vultures actually lay their eggs right on the ground. They rarely build a nest. They might have it near some brush or some logs, um, maybe in a cavity somewhere in trees. And there are some vultures that even make, that do make nests that are in a communal setting that are high up in trees. So it really varies. The top picture is a turkey vulture um, on their eggs laying flat down on the ground. In the bottom, picture is, I think, a really cute picture. That is what our little turkey vultures look like when they hatch. And you can kind of gather as they grow older, they lose that down on their neck and kind of their blackish face does turn to that, that red color as they, as they mature. Uh, most vultures, like we had mentioned right at the end of the last slide, do regurgitate food to their young. Unlike our raptors who rip up that meat and feed it to the young, our vultures already eat it and then regurgitate it back to them. Most vultures lay anywhere between one to three eggs and the incubation can take 30 to, to 40 plus days. And generally both parents help take care of the young in the nest. Once again, if you think of, of differences to some songbirds that are vultures, they're not sexually dimorphic, which means you can't just by look, looking at them easily tell the male from the female. It's the same thing with raptors. The females might be a little bit larger, but that's, um, but that's not, necess not necessarily true. And sometimes when they're in flight, uh, it might be hard to tell apart, so. Um, once again, really interesting birds. So now that we kind of have a general idea and general characteristics of, of vultures, and now that we know they're super cool, uh, we're going to take a look at a few of our new world vultures and learn their stories. All right, so we're starting off with our classic turkey vulture. Um, I just think, as you can tell, I think they're a really cool bird. They're definitely one of my favorites. Once again, something I, I learned new was that their Latin name, Cathartes Ara. And once again, I apologize if I'm not saying this correctly for anyone who does a great job at speaking Latin. Uh, it actually means cleansing breeze. Cleansing breeze. So maybe it's because they have a really beautiful soar and you don't see them flap their wings too much, but I thought that was an interesting uh, translation. As you can tell, flying high up in the sky, if you, most of us probably have seen some type of vulture, especially our turkey vulture, they have that classic kind of dihedral, that soaring V wobble. It's very teetering. They are a large dark bird, with broad long wings and we call them like fingers at the end of their wingtips um, and they have longer tails that extends past their toe tips in flight. Generally our turkey vultures can weigh between two to four pounds with a wingspan of up to six feet. So they're a bigger bird uh, and they're adapted to live in a wide range of habitats. So back in 2016, um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology had estimated that there are around 18 million turkey vultures that roam the globe. So they are not a species of concern right now. They're doing a great job. Um, and what's also really cool about them is that when turkey vultures court, the pair actually performs what's called a follow flight display where one bird kind of leads the other through twisting and turning and flapping flights for a minute or so and then it repeats it over periods as long as three hours um, so if you see turkey vultures that are just look kind of like they're doing wonky things it's probably a 
they're courting each other because normally you see them catching those warm thermals usually a little later in the morning. They're not very early risers. Most vultures aren't because they catch those warm thermals and rise up and, and soar, um, which is really cool. And does anyone know what a group of vultures is called? Because like we said, they're very social. So you tend to see them um, in larger groups. Does anyone have an idea? There are a few different names. Anyone have an idea what a group of vultures is called? Yeah, committee. That's one of them. Great job. Anyone know the other two? I didn't know the other two. They're called a venue or a volt. Um, so committee, venue, or volt when they're all just together. In flight, we, um, there's another term for them. Yep, volt, <laughs> V-O-L-T. I'm not quite sure why that name came up. Once again, it would be a cool challenge if you wanted to look more into it later and feel free to email us and, and let us know. Um, when they're flying up, they are called kettles. You also hear hawks if they're flying in a kettle. And this one is really cool. Does anyone know what vultures are called when they are feeding together at a carcass? There's a specific name for that. When a group of them are feeding on a carcass, what is the name? Anyone have any guesses? A <laughs> buffet. That's a good one. I like that not a buffet. It's a bit more slightly morbid. <laughs> it is actually called a wake. So when they are feeding together at a carcass, it is called a wake. So they are, that's maybe how they're showing respect for that animal at their wake is they're taking care of its body. Really cool. This is their range map. You can see the, the reddish colors, they're breeding and that kind of bluish purple color is their year round. Um, they are a resident uh, to a long distance migrant. Some turkey vultures in the Southern United States are year round. Some birds in the Northeast migrate short distance southward to maybe North Carolina or into Louisiana. And the Western birds tend to migrate much farther, which large numbers, counting more than a million, moving through Central America, and in some cases, as far as Ecuador. So it's really interesting. They, um, a lot of times they really don't like the cold, but it, it varies, as you can tell here. That's our turkey vulture. Our next vulture uh, is our black vulture. I think they're really beautiful. Um, they are, once again, a broader bird. In flight, they hold their wings flat and angled slightly forward, so it's not as distinctive as our turkey vulture flight. Um, their tail is much shorter and rounder, and they have very small bare heads, as you can see, but that's nice hooked bill, and they are smaller than a turkey vulture. So, Black vultures tend to weigh up to maybe a little more than three and a half pounds with a wingspan of four feet, whereas our turkey vultures, if you remember, their wingspan can be up to six feet. As you can tell in flight, they have that uniform black except for those white patches or stars on the underside of their wingtips. And that can be really hard to see um, in strong light or if they're really far away. And then that skin of the head is black. So like we had mentioned before, um, our vultures, especially our black vultures, are very social animals. They, they have close families. And black vultures have actually been known to share food with their relatives and feed their young for months after they've fledged. So normally once a baby bird fledges, the parents are like, cool, see you later, good luck in life. Um, <laughs> these black vultures, for for whatever reason probably helping to keep them alive keeping their population numbers good tend to feed them a bit more um, the black vultures usually nest in dark cavities such as caves or hollow trees 
they've been known to, to take up the abandoned building. And if the pair is successful, they will actually reuse that site for many, many years because black vultures are monogamous and they will stay with their mates for many years year round. Um, and they're also a vulture that lays their eggs directly on the ground. Here is the range map for our vulture. You can see our year round, our black vulture. Uh, they are a resident to maybe a short distance migrant. Uh, individuals that spend the summer in northern or higher altitude parts of the range tend to move southward or downslope for the winter. So you can see that uh, if you think back to our turkey vulture map, our turkey vultures are much more widespread, but they definitely overlap. Um, especially along the, the lower east coast down that range, uh, which is really cool. Has anyone ever seen black vultures before? Been in an area where they're able to find a black vulture? Yeah? Cool. I have not yet. I, I would really like to. I think they're they're beautiful down in Texas. It's fantastic. Cool birds. All right. Now moving on to our greater and lesser yellow-headed vulture. Now I put both of them on the same slide for a reason, and that is because they were considered the same species. They were both considered greater yellow-head vultures up until they split in 1964. I personally feel like as a, if you're a scientist um, or ornithologist, someone that studies birds, my professor in college would say you're either a lumper or a splitter. So you either tend to lump things together, like, oh, generally the species has the, you know, similar same DNA or behaviors or whatever it may be, or you're a splitter, we're like, no, 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 this one is a little different, we're gonna break it off. So clearly they were split. Um, they are both found in South America. Our greater is found in tropical moist lowland forests. It's also a fairly large bird with a wingspan up to five feet and can also reach a weight of around three pounds. Uh, the body is black and the head and neck, which are featherless, range in color from a deep yellow to a pale orange. The lesser is found a bit further. It's Mexico, Central America, and South America. And they're in seasonally wet or very flooded lowland grasslands or swamps. It's also a large bird, can have a wingspan of five feet, and the body is a bit more brownish in color, um, not as glossy as the graders. And the head and neck have that pale orange and they tend to have a bit more red or blue in areas. What's really interesting as well is that both of these vultures rely on the king vulture, which is another new world vulture that lives down in South America to rip into the hides first because the great and the lesser yellow-headed vultures don't have very strong beaks. Um, but the flip side to that is that the king vulture doesn't smell as well. So the king vulture will follow the greater or lesser yellow heads to the kill and then they will rip into it first and then our greater and lesser yellow heads can come in. So once again, I find that really interesting how the different species of vultures tend to rely on one another when they're in similar or overlapping territory. Um, so the top picture is a greater yellow headed vulture and the bottom is our lesser. So the larger one is the greater yellow-headed vulture and it tends to have a longer and broader tail and like I mentioned before their plumage is a bit darker and a lot more of that glossy black in contrast to the lesser yellow-headed vulture which has more of that browner plumage you can kind of see in that bottom picture. Its legs are also darker in color and its head is more yellow and less of that orange and pink 
than that of the lesser yellow-headed vulture. And the greater has broader wings and has a steadier flight. They're kind of tongue twisters <laughs> to, to talk about them. Um, has anyone ever traveled down in South America and seen the greater or lesser yellow heads? I don't know if everyone's been adventurous. Yeah, you have in Nicaragua? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I would love to. I spent some time in Ecuador, but um, I did not see them. I was on the lookout for the Andean condor. I also did not see that. Beautiful. So the map on the left is of the greater uh, vulture, and the one on the right is the lesser. So you can kind of see in the places where, where they do overlap, but really cool birds, very interesting. Okay, our last new world vulture we're going to talk about is our California condor. Um, they are our largest bird in North America and they are also endangered. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. So. In flight, the, the body is noticeably very bulky and the head appears small and the tail is short and broad. Uh, their wingspan, does anyone have a guess as to um, how long their wingspan is and how much these birds can weigh? Yeah, great guesses, everyone. So, the wingspan can be up to like nine feet. Anyone guess how much they can weigh? How large these birds actually are? It blew my mind you know, always to read about it and just see it in front of you again. I love all the guesses. Less than a hundred, great guesses though, yeah around 20 pounds or so. So they are a big bird. If you think about like getting a, a turkey, like if you do Thanksgiving, like a 20 pound turkey, that's large. Um, <laughs> the adults are black with that beautiful striking white patches under the wings. Um, they have that naked head and neck or kind of that yellowish orange. You can see it in the top picture. Whereas immatures have dark heads, grayer necks and kind of a mottled grayish instead of those clear white patches. Um, the adult coloration is reached between six and eight years of age. So they won't look like a full adult until between six and eight. Um, they are amazing gliders. They travel wildly. They feed on a variety of carcasses of deer, pigs, sea lions, whales, um, any other animal. And they tend to, to nest up high on, on cliff faces. So spectacular bird. They can cover hundreds of miles with their, their soaring and those large, large wingspan. Um, but in the 1980s, the population fell to just 22 birds, which is crazy to think about, just 22 birds. Um, but now we have around 230 free-flying birds in California, Arizona, and Baja, California, with another about 160 in captivity. Now the ones in captivity, some might be in zoos, but they're not, they're not as pets. A lot of them are being used as well to, to breed and then release their the young into the wild. And one of the main reasons that this California condor had such a big crash um, and its population was, was lead poisoning. Um, it remains a severe threat to kind of their long-term prospects along with uh, pesticides and things like that. This all kind of gr groups together because these such large birds have a slower reproduction rate. So female condors lay only one egg per nesting attempt and they don't always nest every year. Um, along with that, the young actually depend on their parents for more than a year. And once again, like we said, they can take six to eight years to reach maturity. So combined with a very small, small niche um, with a slow reproduction rate, if those eggs don't survive, whether it's because of natural selection, bad luck, mortality rate, whatever it is, they're not laying like five, a clutch of five, they're laying one, um, which, which 
for those guys, because they focus so much energy on it, they really want that one to, to survive. They probably live up to 60 years or older, but we're not quite sure because none of the condors that are now alive are older than 40, if you're able to, to do that math. And they have been, like we said, successfully reintroduced into the mountains of Southern and Central California, Arizona, Utah, and Baja California. Uh, their nesting habitats range from that scrubby chaparral to forested mountain regions up to about 6,000 feet in elevation. Uh, and their foraging areas can be far, far away from their primary nesting site. So they have a very long commute, if you will, to where they get their food to where they nest. Uh, because the condors glide and soar when foraging, they really rely on dependable air movements and terrain that enables extended soaring flight. Um, and because they're so heavy, they can have trouble taking off. So a lot of times they will use open windy areas where they can run downhill or launch themselves from a cliff edge or exposed branch to get airborne. So once again, that's another thing that's very specific about them and their habitat that uh, can make it harder for them to, to reproduce if they don't have that, that land. And before, you know, captive breeding programs began in the 1980s, all of those remaining condors foraged in an area encompassing 2,700 square miles. So they really stay kind of located in one area. But now the range is expanding as the wild population grows and we've learned more about these condors and because they're endangered, take a lot of effort to preserve their, their habitat. And the young condors actually learn the full extent of their range, partly from other more experienced birds. So there's all these layers to these amazing condors. And here, as you can see, they're non-migratory and this is where you can find them. <laughs> um, very select locations. Has anyone ever seen one in the wild before? And yes, someone, sorry, I forgot to mention, someone said, is that a band um, or a tracker? So you could see, oh, we have seen someone see them. That's amazing. So I'm going to move back to my picture. Yeah, you can see that says number nine. So if you were able to see our bird banding webinar, if not, it's also on our, our YouTube. Um, we talked about how we ban lots of songbirds. Well, these guys, because we really don't want to mess with them too much, they have these big, it's essentially their number. Um, it's like a little tag. It, it doesn't hurt them. It doesn't harm them. But it's, you can easily see it from with your binoculars um, or if you get a good picture of them. So you know that is the only number nine how they're doing, if they have young, if you still see them around. That is one of the ways that we can help uh, not only learn more about them, gather research and, and help conserve them. So thank you so much for pointing that out. I'm, I'm sorry I skipped that earlier. Oh, you tried to see one at Zion. Yeah, I would love to see one. You've seen several in Big Sur. Oh, Tyler, you're so lucky. <laughs> Seems like we have to make a trip out to Big Sur when it's safe. Uh, Awesome. So with, with that, vultures and humans, you know, we're, we're very much intertwined. Uh, as we noted before, they're essential to our ecosystems to prevent the spread of, the spread of diseases. Um, there's actually been a case study. So it's not, we're just not just saying that. About a decade ago, there was a massive die-off of an endemic vulture species in India and Pakistan. Um, and this kind of gave us a look into what, what was happening. So Keith Bildstein, who was the interim president, and Sarkis Akopane, the director of the conservation science at the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Origsburg, Pennsylvania, noticed that as the birds became almost non-existent, dogs, wild or feral dogs, stepped into the breach and thrived upon the carrion that was previously mostly ingested by the vultures. Now, the reason why the vultures were dying was because this cattle they were, they were eating 
had an arthritis drug that was killing them off. Once again, they're very sensitive. This was apparently one of the things that vultures' stomachs could not handle and it would kill them. No one really knows why the dogs weren't harmed by this drug, um, but the dog population exploded because of that. And with that did the spread of rabies. Now in the US, you might not really think of rabies as a big thing, like unless you see a rabid raccoon or somehow got in contact with a bat. Most of us get our dogs vaccinated every year. However, in other parts of the world, rabies is a big deal. Some 330, excuse me, some 30,000 Indians die from rabies each year, with a majority of cases being caused by dog bites. So scientists believed that the inability to keep human rabies deaths in check was correlated with the loss of the vultures. And there was the scientific paper that backs this up that uh, Dr. Graves had done earlier. So it just goes to show you that it affects us. It should just give us another reason to respect these vultures. They said it helps keep nature clean like we had mentioned before they're they're the cleanup crew they're crucial to our ecosystems um, vultures can face many threats uh, poisoning is one of the biggest ones another one you can think is car collisions because a lot of the roadkill happens near cars and so if they're near there drivers might not see them um, and you can also see that our turkey vultures <coughs> excuse me, not just turkey vultures, but our vultures in general um, are very sensitive, even though they're these amazing birds with all these cool adaptations to survive, but those, those different poisons can really get to them. So think about ways that you can help out not only vultures, but birds in general. So you can think about that. How can we help them? Maybe it's not throwing that apple core out your car window because that won't attract rodents and that won't get those rodents killed and that won't bring the, the birds to them. Um, they're amazing. You can see here, this is, this is me. Um, this is many years ago. <laughs> I was able to work at an outdoor school that had a special permit by the US Fish and Wildlife that allowed us to have non-releasable raptors in order to teach um, our local school kids about. So we had a golden eagle, a red-tailed hawk, a great horned owl and our turkey vulture. So I spent over a year not only teaching with these birds but taking care of them in their day-to-day -day life. And let me tell you, this is where I fell in love with my turkey vultures. Um, this one right here, he was hit by a car. So his left, his right wing was broken. You can kind of see it hanging down on the opposite side. It was never able to be fully repaired so he cannot fly. And he had such a personality. We would put him down to like let him exercise um, outside of his mew, which is what we call essentially their really big bird cages, if you will. Um, when of course, when the kids weren't there and he would follow you around and he would try and like peck at your shoes and like get my shoelaces undone. And he was like a toddler almost is what I had um, thought of it as. So really cool bird. I also learned firsthand that the, the projectile vomit when we'd have to take care of him, for instance, if he had a, a broken blood feather wing, um, so a wing that was growing, and because his, uh, or excuse me, a feather that's growing on his damaged wing, it would get broken, um, and we would have to, to pull it out so it wouldn't provide uh, pain for him. And so I would get the job of gently holding him, but he did not like that, so I have been vomited on. It does not smell good. I wish I could have ran away. Um, so, so yeah, really great birds. So I just challenge you to, to really do your own research into it as well. Learn about these amazing creatures. Um, really, really special birds. I felt very privileged and very lucky to be able to, to work firsthand with them. So thank you so much for that. And finally, um, thank you. Uh, we want you to, to keep in touch. We are nearing just about our, our 12 o'clock, um, our hour limit. And once again, we want to be respectful of everyone. 
Sarah had mentioned this at our last webinar. Um, after this one, starting in August, for the next few months, we're just going to move to monthly webinars starting in August, just so we have time to focus on some other things. But um, once again, keep checking our Facebook page, our website. You can email us. We're still going to be here. We're going to focus a bit more on, on fall migration as well. Uh, if you've heard Meredith before, she'll be coming back to join us. Um, We'll also be sending you out an email with everything. It has a PDF, it has the link to our YouTube. It also has our survey. If you could take a few minutes and just put in the survey, we're always looking for new topics, ways to improve. Um, so once again, we will continue with these. It is just moving to a monthly webinar, but it'll still be on Thursdays at 11 o'clock um, just for the next few months. So uh, thank you all. So, so much uh, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, I saw some of you are, are making donations. I cannot tell you how insanely grateful I am for that so we can keep doing what we love and, and educating and learning together. Um, and like I said, monthly webinars and then for the next couple months and then we'll pick back up again. Um, so thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful and safe weekend. I hope you all can get out and maybe see some turkey vultures on these warmer days and think how cool they are and go on um, to tell all of your friends and families about them. So thank you again. And we'll see you around. <laughs>